and uh, you do need to make sure that it is an acceptable source of funds. You can't use cash. So if you have cash in your mattress, you can't use it. It's got to be in your account. It's got to be seasoned there for at least two months. Now we will go into the second section of our presentation, which is actually buying your home and what to look for in it. And during this time, I'm actually going to pass it on to Demi. So thank you, Erica. Oh, okay, so hi, good evening, welcome. So yeah, once you have your loan and Erica, you're so right, it's uh, so important and people come to us and we always tell them, if you don't have a loan, you don't have a home, unless you've got cash, <laughs> not only your mattress, right? <laughs> so uh, the next step is you have now gotten your loan ready, you know what you're approved for, now we can go out and shop. We will usually set you up on the search. We have all kinds of systems now that we use that we can drip on you with some um, home that comes on the market, the price reduction now, as you see that, you've just seen that. Hi. Uh, that will be the um, beginning process. Uh, there's another website you can access to, but I always recommend talk to your realtor because we have the most accurate data as far as homes coming on the market. We also have some fun pocket listing information that may be coming up and not yet publicly advertised. Um, what's important once you um, decide and you have now got your loan pre-qualified rate to start shopping is to think about the location and neighborhood. You may already know that if you live locally and you want to stay in your town where you grew up, you know, every street and everybody, that's great. But sometimes you may be relocating from out of state, you may be relocating from Los Angeles to here in Simi Valley, let's see, and you may not so be so familiar with the neighborhood. Again, always consult your realtor. Uh, they, I'm sure, have a lot of experience and knowledge in the neighborhood. They can kind of guide you without misleading or anyway, no, not, no staring. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, but what I suggest, once you get the email alert and or you see a house online that you really like, uh, take a little bit of a drive by, drive in the neighborhood and see what it's like, you know, and watch for the environment around it. And if you consider about- Can yes. you trust Zillow prices? If you can adjust them? Yeah, can you trust, trust them when oh. you see them online? Well, you know, they're getting better, but for many years they were pulling old data and we were seeing people calling us because, oh my gosh, this house is this $450,000, but in reality it was 800 because they kept pulling old data, but it's readjusting. So I think that's why it's important to really have uh, your realtor set up a search right from the multiple listing services. It's fresh, it's it's at the minute, as soon as an agent go in and enter a new listing, it will pop on your uh, iPhone, on your um, email, and you can right away scroll some pictures more and more nowadays. We set up videos, you can watch the videos, but definitely take a drive by and learn the neighborhood. Um, and then feel free to check the schools and everything. Are we talking about? Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, taxes. Um, well, taxes are. If you're here in California and in like Los Angeles and Ventura County, it's you pay tax for your property one and a quarter percent. So, and it's a yearly. You you pay twice a year. You can build it into your loan. Erica could explain that to you how that works, so you don't have to cut a big check twice a year and it's like oh thousands. Should of I dollars. just jump and tell right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so there's like, so, another section. Oh, there is that. Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> She knows the slide better than us. Um, so that's it about it. Uh, tax really. Um, and age of the home. So a lot of people are concerned sometimes with the houses built 1940. It's probably all outdated, old plumbing, things like that. Uh, that's why you get a home inspection, right? So you want to inspect when you purchase your home and your inspector will be able to pretty accurately tell you the age of equipment around the home, your water heater, your furnace, the plumbing, electricity, if it's been updated at one point. Uh, definitely if you have a, you purchase a newer home, especially built after the 1994 earthquake, uh, you're going to see a lot of things brought up to code for earthquake and things like this. Um, but even though the older home Example, our home is built in the early 60s, but it's as strong as a stone. You know, it is so well built because back then they used better material. Um, so that's something to be uh, aware of also. It's not because the house is older that it's not a good purchase. Um, and then the utilities, of course, 
when Erica talks about your monthly payment, what's the, how much can it cost me to buy a home? And especially if you're renting an apartment, an apartment right now and they may be paying water for you and things like that, or very low cost of electricity, you may not realize owning a home may cost you a lot more than just an apartment. Uh, so you definitely want to run the numbers. And a question we all often get asked to us as a listing agent will be, can you tell me how much the utility bills is in this, you know, how much do you pay for water? How much do you pay for electricity? And getting that from the homeowner, it's a, of course, it's subjective. If it's a couple, two people that lives in the house versus a family of five kids, mom, dad, grandma, that's moving out, they definitely use the property a lot more than you will, right? So, um, so just, you got to rebalance that, but it's a good thing to check when you first go home. Um, and then uh, the condition maintenance, of course, again, when you purchase a home, a seller has some obligation to disclose things about their home. If they've done any upgrades or if they had a leak in their home that was either repaired or not, but they have to disclose that. The question we are being asked all the time is like, how many years back do they have to tell you as long as far as they can remember? Basically, the answer is if, if they repair something yesterday, yes, they got to tell you. If they repair something 20 years ago, they got to tell you. There's forms for it. As a buyer, you will receive, we call it seller disclosure statement, uh, TDS, SPQ, we call it with our terms. And you receive that and you have time to review it. Usually you will have about 10 to 17 days to review those documents with your agents. And if you're a first time home buyer, your agent will guide you what to look for, what to pay attention. And these may trigger more questions. Um, it's good to try to put your hand on those um, from the seller prior to your home inspection and provide it to your inspector when they arrive so that they have a guide of what to look for also during the inspection. The inspection will be a pretty thick package, sometime over a hundred pages long of inspection report. A lot of it is just the normal legal stuff they have to put in it, but often they will highlight the first couple of pages, the most important thing they saw that usually health, safety, uh, hazard, things like this, that they will, they will bring up to the front of the inspection report and you want to pay attention to those and discuss with your agent again, should you ask the seller to repair any of those. Bear in mind, seller this in California, homes are sold in, in its as this condition, which means a seller does not have to do anything. They don't have to bring a home to code. They don't have to fix anything. So it all depends on the negotiation. Sean will tell you there's several phases in, in the negotiation, right? And he always tell his buyer, Sean is a real estate agent also, and he will tell the buyer, we can negotiate really, really strong at the beginning on the price and all that. But you know, when we get to the inspection, if there's issue, don't expect so much from the seller to do more if you already got your bottom price here from them. You know, so there's a balance. Um, so, but it's all negotiable. They don't have to fix anything yet. There is a form called request for repair in California that allow you to ask for the repair. Again, they can say no, they can meet you halfway, they can give you a credit, they can adjust their price, it's different than they can. Um, so the, if I can jump in on yeah. that too. Can you? If, if, the, if the seller doesn't want to fix anything, you could walk away, right? True, yeah. So you're not locked in stone if they don't want to do anything. The seller doesn't have to sell their house as is, but you don't have to buy it as is either. That's a, such a good point, yeah. Right. Because you may feel like, what? They don't have to fix anything. Mm -hmm. What if there's like, major crack in the slab, now I'm stuck to buy now. You have the contingency period. Um, anybody knows how many contingency there is on, on the purchase contract when you buy a home? Kane? Mm -hmm. uh, cool. I, I don't know. I mean, you have three, the main one, right? Your loan, your inspection, and your appraisal. So you have these three. Unless you cash, you don't deal with loan and appraisal. You may have have also a fourth one, which is selling your home. We call it COP. So you may have a contingency on you're going to buy this home just if you um, able you're able to sell your home. So too bad you didn't answer. You would have got a little booty bag. So next time, <laughs> take a guess, people. Take, take a guess. guess. <laughs> but you know, really quick too, what Demi was saying about the seller credits and um, or even negotiating and things like that. Up until probably a, a month or two ago there was really not much room for negotiations. Like sellers had the ball in their court. So buyers were really having to take whatever they could get. Now it's starting to turn around. So um, people are able to negotiate seller credits to cover any repairs or maybe negotiate that the sellers, right, will, will fix something before you purchase the home. So 
those negotiations are opening up a little bit more in the buyer's favor compared to how it has been. It's so true. The market will often determine what's going to happen. Right now, the previous uh, transaction were where the seller didn't do anything at all, got 100 grand above list, and they stayed two months for free in their home after they closed escrow. So you as a buyer, you're sitting there waiting to finally get mm -hmm. your home and have somebody living in there for two months for free. Uh, but you know, it 59 was days, 59 <laughs> days, <laughs> you have to be occupying it by 60th day. <laughs> so, uh, that time has changed your market. Um, there's still situation like this, but, but less and less. And with the rate that has climbed up a little bit and the market, you know, buyers are thinking to buy now, it's a good time before it spike back up in the end of 2023, probably. So, um, Size and space, so definitely you're going to be purchasing based on your family size. Maybe it's everybody wants a 5,000 square foot home with six bedroom, a pool and view, and the whole nine yard. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you may want to do stepping stone if it's your first home, you know, unless you can afford it. Hey, we're mm -hmm. all on it. We'll, we'll sell you that $2 million home right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes stepping stone, and you may at that point where you raise your step to the largest larger home, you may be able to save this one home at the rental property, you know, so that's something to think about. But think about how many people in your family, how much space you need. Now with COVID, a lot of people work from home. Do you need that office space? So a lot of people had to go a little bit bigger on their purchase now because they need that room. And at the beginning of COVID, people were excited to work from home. Now it's like, honey, there's a garage back there. We could always convert into an office because you're a little too close from here. So it's tough to think about. And the uh, buyer's agent versus selling it. Okay, so of course, there's two agents in the transaction normally. That agent can be the same on both sides, but you have the buyer agent, we also call the selling agent, and the seller agent, which is called the listing agent. So the listing agent is the one that went into your home, they were called to list the property, determine the price, and put the house in the market. That's your listing agent. The buyer agent will be the one that you will probably use as a buyer to go out and search for home with you, uh, negotiate contract, negotiate repairs. They're the one who's going to go and open the properties for you, tour the property, and discuss um, the purchase process. Um, yes, you could buy from the listing agent, of course. California has uh, no, they don't discriminate that. Some states don't allow dual agency. Here it's allowed. Just, just be aware, you know, using both, you know, you want to have somebody like us, our team, very fair, very honest, and representing both equally, managing through without any um, discrimination on any side. But having a good buyer agent on your side is always good because then it's like, that's your pal, that's your buddy. You know, they're going to guide you, they're going to protect you, you know, they'll make sure that, that they get you the best price possible. And if there's stuff to be negotiated during the inspection or the appraisal, like you said, if, if did you say that if it doesn't appraise? No, you didn't mention that. But if the house does not appraise, that's another time you have to renegotiate. Again, you can always walk away, but you have a good agent on your side. They could negotiate lowering the price for you after the appraisal. Well, really quick, I mean, with the buyer's agent and the seller's agent, they obviously have to get paid. But I think a lot of people are surprised to know that when you're buying a house, the agent that's representing you, you don't have to pay for them, right? Right, so what there's happened, a certain way I have to say it legally, yes, but uh, yes, go ahead, you take, you take that yes. part. <laughs> I know the California Association of Realtors are kind of hitting on our head a little bit. We're like California Association of Disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. We, we do get paid. Uh, so if I list the property, I'm the listing agent, Joe call me, I'm putting it's one, two, three, four Main Street on the market today, and um, King comes with you to purchase a home. What's your name? Oh. Alan, Alan and Kane showed up, shows up and purchase, he writes an offer, purchase my listing. I negotiated with my client already the buyer agent commission. So it's it's built into the listing price. So when Kane come and we close that scroll, my seller will pay him. So you don't write a check. You, you don't have, have to, pay to pay your him. agent when you're the buyer. Yeah. So it's all done. So make sure it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I think that's about uh, the expectation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anybody now? You guys want to add something as far as agent or? I think you skipped the loan officer part. That's going to be her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's the well, lender. Yeah. So you can kind of describe yeah. what is a loan officer. Yeah. So, um, so I'll just you know, loan officer is, is one 
there's loan officers and there's um, mortgage brokers, there's different types of lenders, okay? But um, there's people that, so a loan officer is independently licensed and for the most part, they're gonna work for a, they're a mortgage banker. So they're gonna work for, usually it's a direct lender. Um, there's also um, uh, lenders that work directly for big banks like Wells Fargo and Bank of America. And they're actually not independently licensed. They're working under the license of the bank that they work for. And then there's independent mortgage brokers who you know own their own agency. And then they also have sales agents that work for them. So there's lots of different types of lenders out there. The most important thing really is just make sure that you're comfortable with both real estate agent and your lender. You know, we're all people. And to me, I think the relationships are really important because as long as you know that somebody that you're working with is knowledgeable, um, you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. You know, you're going to be going and looking at properties with your real estate agent. And then when, once you're in escrow and even during the pre-approval process, you're going to be talking to your lender a lot. You know, they're going to be asking for a lot of personal documentation. And so you want to make sure that it's somebody that you're comfortable with and somebody that you kind of like spending time with because it's really, it's, it's going to be quite a process and you don't want it to be something that you just are, are dreading. You know, you don't want to dread talking to the person that's going to be helping out. So that's my two cents on, on that. And I would say, Erica, you know, I'm reading above it, like the setting up expectation that's so important at the beginning when you consult with your lender and your agent, you know, have, make sure there's expectation set up, you know, first, your time frame, you know, what you're looking for, but also uh, budgeting and when are you available to look at properties, all that kind of stuff and communication. Um, nowadays, it's easy through text, sometimes a good phone call or over a cup of coffee, you know, it's, it's always good to uh, um, really stay in touch and communicate very clearly your expectations, same for the agent. And, yeah, I'll always share. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And I'll say like, you know, for me, for, you know, I, I kind of, I, I love what I do. So like, I'm, I'm always going to answer. I mean, Dummy and Jocelyn, I spend a lot of time with them. You know, they'll see me answer my phone or it'll be nine o'clock at night. And if you're going to go work with someone, you know, at a Wells Fargo or Bank America, no diss to anybody that might work there. <laughs> um, you're usually going to have somebody that's working like nine to five, you know, their phone gets cut off at five o'clock. And so they're not going to be working on the weekends. If you're going and looking at a house and the deadlines are that day, you want to make sure that you are going to be working with somebody that's going to be able to take your call and provide pre-approval letters and reach out to the listing agent when you want to make your offer look really strong. So those are all things to kind of consider. And of course, this is a lot to remember. So we will make sure that we give you guys all these you know, updates and everything um, like that. And there's, I would like to um, have Liz speak. I know there's a paragraph book. Yeah. Because I think it's important to understand also having insurance for their mm -hmm. property. Could right. you jump in now or... Oh, oh, oh we're, we're still so, we're yeah. still going to continue. Oh, okay, it's actually okay. jumping into actually making an offer. Oh, oh, okay. So my yeah. turn. Oh, <laughs> making an offer. Okay. Um, you still have two more three slides. Oh gosh. Okay, that's a, a lot of conversation. Maybe I'm going to have Sean jump in at one point. <laughs> Make an offer. So once you have preview and look at properties and you narrow down a home you really really like, the next thing is to put an offer. Um, in different markets, sometimes you have to think about it yesterday. If it's, you think about it today, it's too late. The house is gone. If you've been watching the market, you know what I'm talking about. That oh, this is huge pending sell. So it's now changing a little bit, so you have time to go preview, see the property, maybe go home, have dinner with your spouse, with your friends, whatever. Call your mom and then talk about, hey, I really like this house. You may have a chance to see it a second time. And once you really decide to purchase that home, then with your agent, you're gonna be writing an offer, check with your lender, make sure the rates are still about the same rates that are changing daily. Now it's like, hey, are we still in the same ballpark that we were a month ago with our rate? And and then formulate your offer. And you offer the several thing to look at. So first, we need your full name, we need your loan approval, and we need proof of funds. So you always have to have your bank account statement, something ready to show to the seller that you are able to buy this home and you do have the down payment and the closing costs. Uh, funds available because if your offer is accepted within three days this ball gets get rolling and need to wire money in escrow right away so there's going to be a three percent good faith deposit that you add into your contract so from your name you write down how much you're going to be offering your good faith deposit now how do you determine the price um again always depending on the market 
but your agent will guide you through that. Of course, we'll write the offer price you wish, but we will guide you to let you know, okay, how many days it's been on the market. How many days it's been on the market. We'll show you comparable sale. The guy next door just sold for $550,000. Mm -hmm. This house is listed at seven fifty, dollars and it's identical. I think they're overpriced. Maybe we have room to negotiate. Also, a great realtor will be calling the listing agent and ask question, hey, How's the activity? Do you have any offer on the table? Do you mind to share with me? And often they don't, but where about should we be at? And what's important for your seller? You know, we we want to know what's the most important. Sometimes the seller price is important, but maybe also I need to get out of here like now. And you'll be like, I, I can close in 21 days. I can get those inspection done in five days. And you, Mr. Seller, Miss Seller, you'll be up to your next um, move, you know? So sometimes the terms is maybe more important than the price, but the price is often the most important. So you'll discuss with your agent, determine the price, write the offer. Um, and in there, how many contingency there is? Three. Three. <laughs> Which one are they? Oh, come on, I just teach you one second. <laughs> So he, he said three, he though, a, he gets a prize. He gets a prize, just <laughs> say three. <laughs> there. Woo! there we go. All right, who can tell me what are the three contingencies, the most important one? We talk about what do you have to do when you buy a home? Appraise, a appraisal. An appraisal. Gosh, this guy's Two more. Another hat. Uh, <laughs> a loan. A loan. And then what are you going to do with the house? Are you just going to buy it? Get the key and that's it. Or did you? What do you do when you buy a car? Inspection. Okay. Do we give him again? Again? <laughs> I think he's, he's like I'm actually a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Good job. So that's very important. Your contingency. So you're gonna discuss again with your uh, agent. The standard of the contract is 17 days to inspect, 17 days for appraisal, 17 days for your loan. All right. But that's all negotiable. If it's a, a market that's pretty hot and you, and especially if we discuss with the seller listing agent and we know they got to move fast, we may be able to change that to a shorter term. That makes you offer some time appealing. If you say, I'm going to inspect in seven days, I'll get my, and we'll call you know the lender first. Can you close, can you get that loan done within 14 days? And she says, there's no way. Then we'll keep our 21. We don't want to, you know, put fire on uh, fuel in the fire <laughs> but if if you say you know what they're ready to go they're a paper they're like good to go i can get that done like 14 days then we'll do that because that's really attractive on an offer and you may be able sometimes to negotiate a better price because you have great terms also so that's how you create your offer maybe explain what the contingencies are for and how they work <clears throat> meaning so a contingency is basically something unforeseen so you go into this yeah. contract with the seller uh you do your inspection and you know you find out it needs a forty thousand dollar roof right that was something that was unforeseen when you wrote that offer so as long as you have that contingency in place you have not removed that inspection contingency you you can walk away without worrying about your good fit deposit yeah, so it's protecting you. It's a certain time you have to do your inspection, get your loan approved, and make sure the house does appraise the, the price agree. So if it does not happen, if your loan falls through, you lose your job at the last one, things like this could happen. Um, like Sean said, a roof is leaking, big crack in the spot, whatever, then you can always walk away if the seller's not willing to renegotiate. And what's in jeopardy is the the your earnest money deposit. So what's called your initial deposit into escrow. So after your offer gets accepted, you know, regardless of how much you're putting for a down payment, everybody's going to kind of, you know, you're, you're saying I'm going to put 3% of the purchase price into this escrow account to hold as a good faith to show you that I'm serious about this offer. And so the contingencies protect that 3% earnest money deposit so that if the inspection goes wrong, if you find out for some reason you can't get your loan approved or the appraisal comes back and it's $100,000 below what the purchase price is that you agreed upon, you have either room to negotiate or you can say that I'm, I'm out of the deal. Mm -hmm. And if you waive those contingencies, meaning if you go into the offer and you say, I'm going to waive my loan contingency, I've already been pre-approved. She has all my paperwork and everything good to go there. If you waive your appraisal saying, you know, there's 10 other offers on this property. I really want this house. Even if it doesn't appraise at what it's going to be, I'm waiving the appraisal contingency. So you have those contingencies put into place or you can waive them. If you waive them, then you have the, the chance of also losing that deposit that you put into escrow.
And when you have your contingencies and the time is up and you have satisfied every step of the way, your appraisal, your loan, and inspection, either you renegotiate um, repairs, price, credits whatsoever, and you're good to go. And let's say it's 17 days, 17 days is up. At that time, there's a form that we provide you that you sign that you're ready to remove your contingency. So until you don't have these removed in writing, your deposit will be safe. Um, you may hear sometimes stories people are trying to like, threat you and scare you like, well, if you don't, then I'm going to you know, keep your deposit. As long as you haven't signed up on that contingency, you're safe. Now, there's a form that a seller can send you called a notice to perform. If you're 17 days is up and you're dragging and you're not removing, a listing agent can suggest the seller to send that notice. And once you get that notice to perform, you got 48 hours to remove that contingency. So at that point, the seller could cancel. And once it's canceled in California, it's a, it's a one week cancellation. You don't need anybody else to approve. If I'm the seller, you're not performing and I'm sending a notice to perform, it's been 48 hours, you're not performing, you're not removing contingency. I send you cancellation, it is canceled. The contract is, your money, your money may be still in escrow, as we're still open, but the contract is canceled, there's no more deal. So that's something that's so important to have an agent that understand that and help you through this deadline and be ready on time. So when we put a little pressure, you need to get, you want to do a refer, let's get a refer out now. Don't wait on the 14, 17 days when you contingency are up because you still need to review those reports. So that's really important. Um, to understand that part. But again, it's a lot to take if you never bought a house, but that's what we're here for. You know, that's something that will be repeated through the transaction and while we're driving around the tenant houses. Um, the counter offer. So once you have written an offer, most time a seller received the offer. Now you have your offer, you have your proof of funds for your down payment, your good faith deposit, your closing cost, and then your loan approval. Uh, and the seller look at that and could counter you. So there's a form counter offer, seller counter offer. If there's more than one counter, it's gonna be sent out to more than one buyer. You will get a seller multiple counter offer. And if, if it's just you, just one offer to counter just you, then you get your seller counter offer. That could also be counter again. You can send a buyer counter offer until you both come to an agreement. So a counter offer agreement. will be something like, okay, you offered seven hundred fifty thousand dollars on the house. They're like, well, I have five other offers here. So um, this person offered this much, this person. So they're going to write back an offer to every other, every person that gave the, I mean, potentially they could do it to just one person, but they'll say, okay, well, um, if you come in with $780,000 or they'll say like, you know, put up your best offer, your, fine, your best and final best offer. Final. And then it's kind of just like, okay, well, let's just guess what these other offers are because our best is going to hopefully be the winning offer. And like Demi said, it's not always just about the price. The terms can come yeah. into play as well if you're, you're able to close a loan faster. But generally speaking, it's going to be the person that offers the most. So a counter offer will list a higher price usually than what was originally offered. And you can go back and forth multiple times on that until you come to an agreement. And, and, and the seller does not have to counter you neither. If there's multiple offers or you can be the only offer and your offer is just not acceptable, you went way too low, you're asking a huge credit towards your closing cost, the seller may just reject your offer. So not to scare you, but our job, what we do great is to guide you to make sure your offer is acceptable. We'll communicate again with the listing agent, let's inform, try to create an offer that is gonna be refused or at least provide you with a counter offer, especially in multiple counter offer, you want an agent that first have a great relationship with other realtor, that's really important, you know, the, the girl that's well known and well liked, like me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to, oh, Demi, I, I'm going to take your offer because I want to work with you. We love those. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, it's, oh, it's fun. So, uh, yeah, about two, three yeah. hours. Well, well jump into comments back. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we kind of went that. through all that. Um, so now we can jump it back to Erica and she can cover um, all the closing costs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, these are some of the fees that you're going to be expected to pay usually up front. Now an application fee is not ever paid up front. Anything that's paid, first of all, except for a couple of things should always go through escrow, but you should never be cutting a check directly to a lender 
or you know, cutting a check directly to a real estate agent, that's that's never okay. So if that ever happens to you, it's completely illegal and you should be working with somebody differently. But your earnest money deposit, like I said, that's that initial deposit that goes into escrow that's counted towards the down payment and the closing cost. You get it back or you get it refunded. The home inspection, that's another thing that you're going to pay for up front. Usually your real estate agent will have a good referral source for you for a home inspection. If you have your own inspector that you know and you trust, you're welcome to use them too. But that is something that's also paid for outside of escrow. An application fee, I don't even, the, yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no application fee. It's free to apply for a mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, appraisal fee. So an appraisal fee can go either way, depending on um, the lender that you're using. So sometimes a lender will go ahead and like front you the appraisal fee. So they'll order the appraisal for you and then they get reimbursed through escrow at the end of the transaction. Um, sometimes a lender will provide you with an appraisal order form. You're going to put your credit card in order to authorize them to order the appraisal and have the appraiser charge your credit card. So that's something that could be paid for outside of escrow. But other than those things, there's really everything else should be gone going through escrow. That is the complete legal way to be doing everything. Escrow is going to have your closing costs. They're going to have one year of homeowners insurance. There we go, homeowners, homeowners insurance. Speaking okay. of homeowners, um, so when you purchase your home, you're going to pay for upfront one year premium of your homeowners insurance. And then after that, if you choose to have your homeowners insurance as part of your mortgage payment, one twelfth. Of the homeowner's insurance, the annual premium goes into an escrow account and it sits there until the next year's homeowner's insurance premium is due and then it gets paid from that account. So you don't have to come up with it at one time, which is nice for some people. Um, then there's escrow and title fees. Um, again, your lender at the beginning should give you an estimate of what you can expect to pay. Um, they never are going to be able to give you the exact numbers until you're in escrow because almost 100% of the time, escrow and title. Are chosen by the sellers. So even though it says escrow and title fees, like that you can shop for escrow and title, when you've signed that purchase agreement, usually that purchase agreement will have already said who the escrow and title is going to be. And you're going to be, you know, obligated to use them. At that point, your lender will reach out and request their fees so that we can give you an actual statement of how much everything is going to cost you. And taxes too. And taxes too. And now we'll just pass it off to Elizabeth, but we'll actually dive in deeper into the mortgage insurance. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Liz. I'm the owner of the Elizabeth Richardson Farmers Insurance Agency, and I'm located um, on the corner of Erringer and Haywood here in Simi Valley. Um, I was going to talk to you a little bit about homeowners insurance. People say, why do I need homeowners insurance? Well, uh, first of all, it protects your home as well as many other things, which I'm going to go into detail. Also, your lender requires it because they have interest in that property. So if there's a fire or there's wind damage, they wanna make sure it's repaired. So uh, if there is a claim and there's damages, you'll get a, a check for several different categories, which I'm gonna go over, but it may be in your name as well as your lender's name. So um, I know some people aren't very happy about that. They think it's their house, but it's not really their house until they pay it off. <laughs> so um, a couple of things I want to talk to you about is um, some of the coverage is, is the dwelling. So that is the structure of your home. Any part of your home that is attached, like a garage, if you have the roof is attached to your garage, that's part of your dwelling. A uh, porch that's attached to your, to your home. There's another um, section is separate structures. Those are things that are not attached to your house, like maybe a gazebo or a fence or um, a porch that's just out there by itself. Uh, there's other things like personal property. Personal property would be your furniture, your clothing, anything that you pick up your home, turn it upside down, that's your personal property. And if there's a fire, you want to make sure you're reimbursed for that personal property. Um, there is also uh, liability coverage. Liability coverage, if, if someone in your home is responsible for damaging someone else's property, you can be sued for um, liability coverages. It could be even, say you have a dog that runs out in the street and bites a neighbor. That's liability coverage. And um, let's see, additional living expenses. So there's a fire or there's a breakage of a pipe in your house and you can't live there. You need to go live someplace else. Additional 
for living expenses. That's another coverage on your home. So it's when you say homeowners insurance, it's not just your home. There's so much more. Um, one last thing I wanted to say is um, there's ordinance or law. So suppose you bought a home that was built in 1970, but now the laws have changed and the house burnt down or a portion of the house burnt down and you need to have a contract to go in and re re make all the repairs. There's some laws that have changed, like now you need a sprinkler in your ceiling. So that's gonna cost you extra money. So we give you extra money. Insurance gives you extra money to make those repairs. There's um, limits. So again, people say, well, why am I spending this much money on insurance? Well, it just depends on how big your house is. It, there's, a, there's a calculation that determines if you have a 3,000 3, square foot home compared to say 1,100 square foot home, what's it gonna take to rebuild that home in the same condition that it was when you had it before? So those are some of the things that I wanted to talk to you about when it comes to insurance. Um, and what are some of the coverages? Now, uh, coverage um, is like apparel is called an event that causes that, um, that claim. So fire and smoke is one of the biggest ones. Also, um, there's water damages. Now, if it's a covered water damage, then, then your insurance will help pay for those floors or the baseboards or maybe some of your furniture that was destroyed. So uh, there's also theft. Someone breaks into your home or vandalism. There's also wind. You know, it's funny how people think wind won't cause damages to your home, but I know um, last year we had some terrible wind damages in here. I was getting calls from my clients all day long. My roof blew off. My roof blew off. Wow. It's a covered claim. It is a covered claim. And um, let's see. There's one other thing I want to talk to you about is deductibles. So deductibles are costs that are paid first before your, um, your claim may be paid out. So if you have a deductible of say $1,000 and your claim is $1,200, you may not want to file that claim because when you do file a claim, it does follow you for at least three years. So you wanna always weigh it out. When I talk to clients, I usually ask them to find out what it's gonna to cost to make those repairs before they just file a claim. Because maybe, maybe it's less than their deductible. But some people will choose higher deductibles because they want a smaller payment. So it, it's kind of a teeter-totter type of thing. So um, those are some of the things I wanted to talk to you about insurance and homeowners. And um, if you have any questions, I'd love to be able to help you. If you have insurance now and you don't understand it, I'd love to be able to go through your declaration page and maybe explain some things and look for some gaps because there are other optional coverages available that doesn't cost you very much. Like maybe a service line costs you maybe $30 a year and it would cover all those, the wires and the, the um, plumbing that brings from the street to your house. I always recommend that coverage for my clients because it's maybe ten dollars to $13,000 to replace some of those things like a service line, like a water line under, the, under the, your um, front yard. And uh, some of the other things may be like extra jewelry coverage. Maybe you have a diamond that's worth a lot of money, some jewelry that you want extra coverage. Those are optional coverages. So again, I love um, to answer any questions you may have. Anybody have any questions? What about earthquake would you suggest? In California, <clears throat> we have to offer earthquake insurance. It is optional coverage. It is um, one of those things that people don't think is going to happen. It's been over 30 years since we had an earthquake. They, but we're, it, we just never know when it's going to happen. It's um, shaking right now. <laughs> yeah, actually, feel that exactly. I don't know. I remember a couple of years ago. It was Fourth of July. I was yeah. looking up the stairs at my kids, and I'm saying something, and all of a sudden, some of my Spanish jerks start doing this. Uh, you know, I ran out there, and I got earthquake insurance and I've had it ever since because my home is my biggest asset. If I don't have my home and I owe $500,000 to the bank and there's no home anymore, you know, they're going to go after you for that money. So really protect, 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 protect your assets. And um, I am so glad 
Thank you so much. How do you deal with uh, the fire that we have in California? Fire? Do you cover Fire is the, one of the biggest causes of, of a claim. I know someone who put a pizza box inside their oven and caused a fire. You know, it's, it's paper. So. Was well, having a it, bad night. Yeah. <laughs> right. So now you gotta have your kitchen replaced. And maybe you can't live in your house because maybe it went into you know another part of the house. So um and, and you know, we do have fire areas that are really high fire areas in California. You know that you hear it all the time on the radio and on TV. Um there's um a lot of companies will not insure the fire portion if you're close to a fire zone. You may have to get a California fair plan to do the fire only. And then the insurance company would do something called WEP, where they, wreck, they cover everything else but fire, like the water damages and the liability and the sudden accident to a breakage of a pipe, that type of thing. So when it comes to insurance, you need to protect yourself. Nobody wants to pay for it, but when they need it, they're the first ones calling on the phone saying, what? I didn't get that coverage. What? And you know we have to say we, we talk about it all. We have to, we have to. We're just protecting you. It's you know that's our job is to protect our clients. And if I have a car and you give me home insurance, do I get a break? We do bundle. <gasps> yeah, twenty five percent discount on your homeowner's insurance if we have at least one auto in your home. So we always recommend um, auto insurance. Farmers offers um, with their home, uh, auto insurance. We offer something called glass buyback. Uh, rock hits your windshield. You need to have your windshield either repaired or replaced. We have your back. The most it's going to cost you is hundred dollars. Oh. Whereas if a lot of other companies may be having you use your deductibles for that. And loss of use on our auto insurance. If your car has to go to the shop because it you're in an accident, regardless if it's your fault or not. We can give you up to $50 a day to go towards either your deductible or goes towards your uh, a car rental. So there's many other things available as well. Last question. So they're closing escrow, they're moving. Will your insurance cover the something happened with the U-Haul truck? <laughs> if they run a truck to move? Would the homeowner's insurance cover that? No, the the their car insurance something. Too. Oh, their car. Yeah. Well, it, it depends. We have to look at that. Usually, uh, the car rental insurance is covered on a similar car as your own car. So okay. that's really how that works. Uh, I would Uber recommend that you get insurance. That's another. That's, that's another. a liability. What's that? Because when you move, your Uber slipped and fell down the stairs. That's right. That is that's a liability. Yeah, any workers that come to your home when you move hers, it's we so also fun. recommend umbrella policies too. Umbrella policies give you an extra million dollars of liability coverage over your home liability and all of your auto liability. And it's very inexpensive to have, but it's it's good to have because you know, driving through um, a stoplight, you know, you blink, another car comes, you hit them. And um, now you're being sued for a million dollars. So we always say, what are you going to sell first? If you have more than one car, you may have to sell your, your vehicles. If you have more than one house, you may have to sell one of your homes to pay off a liability uh, uh, claim. So really important to have the right coverages. And that's what I'm here for, is to help you with that. Any questions, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. I'm not trying to scare you guys. Like your house is not going to burn down. <laughs> like that. It's things to think about, though. You know. Yeah. We'll just jump into the actual getting your mortgage loan. Okay. This is fun, fun, fun part. Okay. P I T A. Kitty. Okay. Principal interest tax and insurance. So this is what your mortgage payment can consist of. Again. Taxes and insurance can be optional if you're putting at least 20% down on a conventional loan. Um, if you get a jumbo loan, there are some jumbo loans that are available. Um, oh, I'm sorry, sorry about mortgage insurance. No. Anyways, yeah, tax and insurance, they can either be part of your mortgage payment or you can keep it um, separate. Again, if it's part of the mortgage payment, it's going into that escrow account, also known as an impound account. It sits in that account until your taxes are due or until your homeowner's insurance is due and then it's paid from that account. Um, 
I guess your your mortgage check's coming up on Sunday. Uh, yeah. Do anybody have questions about that? Principal interest, tax, and insurance. Okay. And then I can go just making sure. Tax um, all right. So fixed rate versus non fixed rate. So do you guys know the difference between fixed rate and non fixed rate? Can this be one of the questions? <laughs> Who wants a hat? Who wants a hat? Just guess. All right. What's it? What's the, what's the fixed difference? rate is uh, you have a fixed interest rate for the life of the loan. That's right. And then the adjustable rate, it can fluctuate depending upon different conditions. That's good. Yeah, the yeah. Yeah. That's right. That is correct. So the most popular is a 30-year fixed loan. It basically means that your, your, your loan is fixed. You're going to have the same mortgage payment at the same interest rate for 30 years unless you refinance that loan or you sell it off. Um, an adjustable rate mortgage, you'll hear people call them ARMS, all right? So they're usually fixed for a certain period of time first. Um, so what's what I've been seeing a lot of recently is a seven-year ARM, a seven-year adjustable rate mortgage. And the way that that works is for the first seven years of the loan, it's going to be fixed at a certain percentage, a certain interest rate, and a certain payment, okay? Um, after that seven-year mark, your interest rate can now adjust to whatever the current market is doing. So the, the idea behind it is that usually it's people just do it because it lowers your payment. An adjustable rate mortgage, generally speaking, will have a lower interest rate. Now, oddly enough, right now, if you're going to be doing an agency loan, which means like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they're not really giving any like discounts on getting an adjustable rate mortgage. Um, so you're going to, if you get that type of loan, you're going to go with a 30 year fix because there's really no benefit to it. But once you get into the jumbo loan space, that's when you're going to be looking at adjustable rate mortgage options and definitely talk to your lender if it's right for you. Cause everybody's loan is so personal to them. You know, it just depends if you know that you're buying this house and this is your starter home, you're only going to be in it for a year or two, build some equity and then go buy something bigger and nicer, or if you know you're gonna be moving out of state, if there's any reason that you know you won't have this loan for a long period of time, then you're probably a good candidate for an adjustable rate mortgage. If you're like purely only getting into it because you can't afford a fully amortized payment, I wouldn't advise you to get it in that case because there's no guarantee that rates are going to go down someday. You are definitely taking a gamble if you, if you choose to do that. And if you don't know that you have some sort of out of, of that property or that loan. Um, and we could talk more about jumbo loans later and those limits and things like that. Down payment options. I jumped the gun. I talked about this already, but um, all right. So this is the initial investment on your home. Obviously, this is going to be the amount of cash that you're putting down on the loan at the very beginning. Okay. Um, the minimum usually is three to 5%. So like I said, with a conventional loan, if you're a first time buyer, you're occupying the property, you can put as little as 3% down. I'm gonna go into the loan amount limits a little bit here because it, it ha one has to do with another. So on a conventional loan, uh, that 3% down payment is only gonna work up to a certain loan amount. Each county has loan amount limits. So LA County, um, this year for 2022, the regular conforming loan limit is 644,000, 644, almost positive about that, okay? Um, but in LA County, so LA County, Orange County, and any county where the average median home price is higher than the rest of the state, it's considered a high cost area. And so you are allowed to get a, what's called a high balance loan. So it's a conforming, high balance loan. In LA County, instead of 644,000, uh, Fannie Mae will allow you to go up to 970,800. Every year, this amount changes, okay? So if you go above that 644 and you're in between that 644 up to 970,000, you have to put 5% down. That's the minimum down payment on a high balance loan. Well, that's a lot of information, but that's what it is. An FHA loan, 3.5% is the minimum down payment. A lot of people think that an FHA loan is only for a first time home buyer. That's not correct. Anybody can get an FHA loan if you are going to occupy the property. And an FHA loan uh, is available on one to four units. A lot of times, I look, I, I like money. Do you, guys, you guys probably all like money, right? So to me, I think one important thing when you're getting into purchasing your first home is if you're able to purchase a home that can also be an investment for you, like a, a cash flow every month, that's something that might be, you might be a good candidate for. 
um, a multifamily residence with an FHA loan. Because if you buy a place that's between one to four units and you use an FHA loan, you only have to put three and a half percent down no matter what. Um, so it's a really good opportunity to get into a space where you can live in one unit, rent out between one and three other units. And that rental income can pay for some of, if not all of what your total mortgage payment is. You kind of just start building your monopoly. Yes. With that, I've heard that if you buy like a quadplex, you actually only need to qualify for one of those doors because the other three doors would be considered income. So, so okay. So there's a number of reasons. Good question. So there's a number of, of things that can you can use in your benefit when you do have rental income properties. So yes, the other the other units can be considered rental income. Um, when you get into three to four units on an FHA loan, it can be a little bit challenging um, in some counties like LA County because of the property uh, values, the purchase prices. Um, there is, and I forget the the terminology that is used for it, but you're when you order an appraisal. Um, it's got to come with a rental survey if we're considering any kind of rent. So um, the rental survey is going to tell you what the rent is in that area that you can get for each unit that you're going to be purchasing. And there is a qualifying factor of the rental income has to cover um, a certain amount of what your mortgage payment is going to be. So that is also something to consider when you're, when you're looking at that. But again, that's just something that you have to work out individually, depending on where you're looking to purchase property and work that out with your lender before you start your property search. What else? What else? Oh, okay. If you put less than 20% down, your loan options include VA. Like I said, what's the minimum down payment for VA? The minimum zero. down payment for a veteran who served zero. our country. She said zero. Zero. Give the lady a hat. But I had a good money. <laughs> FHA and conventional, which we just went over. And now, is this where you come in, Jocelyn? So conventional mortgage, if you put less than 20% down, you do have to pay private mortgage insurance, but it's, it's not a bad thing. And let's let Jocelyn tell you why. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. Yes, my name is Jocelyn, and I'm the account manager with MGIC. And a lot of people have heard of private mortgage insurance, but they're not really sure what it is. A lot of times they confuse with PMI, private mortgage insurance, but it's all the same. So you can hear PMI, private mortgage insurance, they're referencing the same thing. And private mortgage insurance is different from homeowner's insurance. So a lot of people also tend to get mixed up with homeowner's insurance. They say, oh, it's already included in my payment. Private mortgage insurance is completely separate. It is what allows you to purchase, as Erica said, with less than 20% down payment. Um, and what basically private mortgage insurance is, by definition, it is in case the bar defaults on that property, it is a guarantee for the lender um, when they do default in that home. So if that bar were to default on that home, uh, the lender would then be at risk because they have help this buyer buy with less than 20% um, down payment. So now if there's private mortgage insurance, the lender will file a claim with the PMI company, if that's us, um, and then we will reimburse a certain percentage of what we've insured when they applied for that uh, loan initially. But what it means to the buyer um, is basically you have uh, now more buying options. You're able to increase your buying options and you're able to keep reserves. Um, if you look at uh, the table, there's a flyer on here um, that says four ways private mortgage insurance benefit homeowners. These are the four strategies and key things that you need to be considering when you are thinking, should I put 20% down or should I put less? Um, the first uh, benefit to utilizing mortgage insurance is you're going to be able to buy sooner than later. Say you make uh, $93,000 uh, a year and you're saving 5% of that annually towards your down payment. If you consider using private mortgage insurance, you'll be able to buy a home with um, as quickly as three years versus continuing to save that extra 5% for a 20% down payment. You're, you're looking at 11 years of having to accumulate that, that percentage. So essentially, it's going to open the doors to a home sooner than later. 
Um, the second um, great benefit to utilizing private mortgage insurance is it's going to help you increase your purchase power. So if you have $10,000 in your savings, um, then you'll be able to purchase a $50,000 home um, with a 20%. But what's 50,000? Nothing, right? Even in today's market, you're gonna need at least 500 and up uh, for a purchase price. But you can utilize uh, mortgage insurance to put as low as 10% or 5%. And if you look at that 5%, now you're looking at a $200,000 home. So it's going to help you increase your purchase power. And this is something that even agents, I think is really good to know because they're looking at to obviously get the highest bid. And so you're looking at different options. So being able to plug in mortgage insurance sometimes can take you to that next tier to be able to offer more when you're out there negotiating. So I think it's really important that if you are working with an agent that recommends you to avoid PMI, run. <laughs> because it is not something you want to avoid. It is something that you want to specifically in this market strategize with and see if you can come up on that purchase price by using uh, PMI. Um, thirdly, it's going to help you keep more in your um, bank account. So if you were going to buy a $200,000 home and you had $40,000 in your savings, that would be 20% right then and there. So you have zero in your savings, which especially coming from a two year pandemic, we all know that you cannot live life with a zero um, budget in your savings, you know? So you wanna be able to utilize your finances um, strategically and PMI is gonna help you do that. So if you were to use PMI at a 5% with that 40,000, you would have $30,000 in your savings. And this can help you with uh, paying towards your closing costs, maybe uh, repairs, you already know upfront that some things are going to have to be updated on the home. Like you can, you can uh, keep this money to use that or you know, just have reserves in your bank account um, in case you know something were to happen, you lost your job or something six months down the line. You wanna have money in your savings so that you know, if something were to occur. And then the fourth um, benefit to utilizing PMI is you're going to be able to cancel it um, sooner and especially when you're looking at FHA versus conventional and FHA loan program like Erica said it is for anybody as long as you're occupying the home but when FHA uh, uh, when you take an FHA loan you're going to have mortgage insurance and that particular mortgage insurance is completely different than private mortgage insurance a lot of people don't know that it's actually two different things so um, the mortgage insurance on an FHA loan is going to stay for the life of the loan. So for 30 years, you're going to pay onto it every single month, unlike private mortgage insurance, which is what I do. And then uh, that will cancel as soon as, as early as 53 months. So imagine that as soon as it cancels, all of a sudden now you're, everything that you're putting, putting towards your payment is you're building equity on it because you're now not making that extra payment towards the PMI. So essentially, for example, when I first bought my first home, I had the 20%, but I knew that putting 15% would keep $25,000 extra in my pocket. So, and I did the math, I said, I will be able to cancel as early as two and a half years. I ended up only really paying close to seven grand in the PMI versus I got to keep $25,000 in my pocket. So when you're looking at that, speak to your loan officer, look at your different options, because having PMI for two, three years is not going to be a deal breaker, um, especially in today's market. Uh, PMI has become very, very competitive. And so it's extremely affordable. And um, when uh, you're looking at these options with your loan officer, they're going to advise you whether you should pay on it monthly or if you should pay a lump sum um, towards it and not have it included in your payment. Um, however you want to go about it, if you are paying it monthly, like I said, it's become so affordable that you could even maybe get a payment of less than $100 sometimes um, on your PMI, depending on your credit, depending on how many bars are in the, um, are occupying that loan, um, then that's when you'll know exactly how much your payment it is. And if you're able to do the math and it's say only $100 um, a month, but you get to keep $25,000 in your pocket, it makes a big difference. So I always say, uh, speak to your loan officer about your different PMI options because it is something that a lot of people have this misconception they need to avoid. 
but it is really truly uh, a benefit to the bars and a strategy in today's market because especially now that the sellers are open to possibly paying towards closing costs etc this is something that you could even negotiate with your agent for them to pay out the pmi and say that pmi is two hundred dollars a month um and you'd like your payment to be um just you know a little bit less you're not comfortable with that payment well, your agent can negotiate them to pay that uh, PMI up front. That's going to save you $200 a month, and that's going to bring your payment drastically lower. So look at your different options with your um, loan officer and um, discuss it with your agent because it is a strategy that you can use in today's market. And with that, I will jump it back to Erica for the actual mortgage application. Part. Okay, yeah. And, I, and I'm going to just say one more thing about what Jocelyn had mentioned. And... Um, so, you know, you're, when you buy a house, it's going to be, you're, you're all, it's kind of like a forced savings account, right? I mean, you're paying your principal and your interest payment, but that principal is going to you, to your asset, to you're going to keep, you're going to continue to grow equity in that house. And I mean, it's just, you know, I, I do truly believe in what she said about keeping some cash aside, because if you've saved up and you barely just have enough to put 20% down. I mean, and then you want to like furnish your house and you have nothing, you know, you have to wait. It's like, I should have just made a payment of like a couple hundred bucks mm -hmm. more each month and, and had all this cash to be able to do what I want to do. And maybe even make some upgrades to the property to where now your property is going to be worth more. So there's, there's lots of different strategies you can use. And in addition, in regards to having the seller possibly pay for mortgage insurance, like we were talking about before with Demi, um, there is a lot more room for negotiations. One thing to, to think about right now in this market is, you know, people are like, you know, interest rates are so high and, um, you know, we think the property values are, are stabilizing right now or whatever it might be. So instead of maybe asking for less on the purchase price or, you know, let's say a property is listed for $700,000 and you're like, well, you know, I don't want my payment to be that high. I'm going to offer six eighty. dollars It would be, and it could be, if, it, if you're worried about the payment, you could do a full offer and ask for a seller credit to buy your interest rate down. Because if you spend, if you pay a couple of points, a point, you'll hear people say, talk about buy down points. And so a point is 1% of whatever your loan amount is. So if you have the seller give you a credit for one or two points to buy your interest rate down, that can knock your payment down to less than it would be if you chopped $50,000 off of the purchase price. So there's different ways that you can kind of be strategic and getting the payment to where you feel comfortable and where it should be. Or you can even finance the private mortgage insurance so, as well. Absolutely. And then not have it in your payment. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So when it comes to an application, and this is something that, you know, you guys, obviously, I, I think most of you, I, I have your contact information, but this is what I would suggest if you truly are just wanting to see if you're ready or if what the steps are you need to do to get ready to purchase a home. I strongly suggest to everybody, fill out a loan application. It's like I said, it, it is free to do. We'll run your credit. We will look at everything over with you guys. And you can kind of determine like, I mean, because if you haven't ever checked it out before, you might have no idea what a, a mortgage payment will look like on a certain price point. So it's just a good idea to kind of have everything in writing. So you fill out an application, that part is super easy. These are going to be some documents that they'll ask for so that we can review to analyze and to come up with how much income you have to qualify, uh, what are the assets you have for down payment and closing costs, plus reserves if needed, things like that. So tax returns, generally speaking, you only need that if you're self-employed unless you're going on with a jumbo loan. Um, employment history, again, generally speaking, you need a two-year employment history. There are some cases where you can make up employment history with, you know, if you're going to school and you just got your, you know, degree and you've only been working for a year, you can show school transcripts as part of that to your employment history. Um, you can show that, you know, um, uh, what what else is considered part of a two-year, like a, an internship, things like that. So there's different ways to make up for that two-year employment history. Um, paycheck subs, if again, if you're an employee, they're going to look at your most recent paycheck subs. Another thing to think about if you're an employee, how many guys are uh, employees right now? Or, okay, your employees, everybody's W-2, nobody's self-employed. Okay, so you might get um, a regular salary, but then in addition to a salary, you could be getting bonus income, you could be getting commission, you could be getting overtime. 
Um, a salary, that's simple, that's easy to qualify. You take your annual salary divided by 12. If you have your salary set up monthly, you know, whatever the calculation might be. But anything in addition to your salary, like commission, bonus, overtime, you also have to have a two-year history of receiving that. So if you've if you just got a new job and you got a salary of you know hundred thousand dollars annually, and then they said plus you're gonna get an additional twenty thousand dollars in bonus, you can't use that twenty thousand dollars in bonus income to qualify until you've been receiving it for two years. In that case, a lender might ask you for your year end pay stub for the last two years. So your year end pay stub for 2020 your end pay sub for 2021. And that will itemize to show us here, here's the total of overtime. Here's the total of bonus. Um, statements from your checking and savings account. Again, that's just going to uh, cover, uh, show proof of funds for your down payment and your closing costs. And when it comes to proof of funds, the way that a listing agent would view it, the agent that's representing the seller, they might, in addition to the down payment and closing costs, want to see that you have extra funds just in case of anything, in case the value comes in short or things like that. So those are just some other things to consider that might make your offer stand out. So if you have extra funds that you don't necessarily want to use for your down payment and closing costs, you might want to show them to show that you know your offer is strong, that you have extra funds if needed. Documents we provide to you, the loan estimate. So the loan estimate is, like I said, it's going to show you your estimated payment, principal, interest, taxes, insurance. If you're purchasing a condo or a property that has HOA, it's going to show your um, estimated homeowner's insurance costs along with um, whatever your estimated closing costs are. Will a condo cost me more? It depends. A lot of people say, you know, I can't afford to buy a house. You know, I'm going to look for a condo. Like, that can be tricky, right? Because if you get like a nice high-end condo, you can have a $800 HOA fee each month. And if that's added to your payment, you, you may have just rather had a single family residence that costs you a little bit more money. So yeah. And also for the condominium, if you're planning on buying one, that's very important that your lender and agent um, check first if it's if you're going with an FHA, if it is FHA approved. Some condominium complex will not approve an FHA loan um, because it's a higher risk um, to their point of view. So that's something to always verify. And there's a list that we go by that will tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes it was approved in the past, and now it's expired. Maybe it's in the work. Um, and the insurance you know, also, when it comes to condo insurance, a lot of people think I already pay my HOA fees, so I don't need to pay for insurance, but they're not understanding that condo insurance is for common areas and typically walls out. So walls in is your responsibility. It's your furniture. It's your upgrades on your countertops or, you know, if there's a fire in, inside your unit, you're responsible to have all those repairs made. If you don't have insurance. Liability too. Of course, yeah, and the liability is one of the biggest ones, and loss of use. You have to go live someplace. I think lenders require now, right? Before it was an option where you did not have to have insurance if you bought a condo. Because oh yeah, no, it's required because, like Liz said, it's walls in, so yeah. we have to you have to get. So your homeowner's insurance is going to be probably less um, because HOA you're paying into the the insurance that the homeowners association provides for walls outside of your complex, outside of your unit. Okay, processing and underwriting. Loan is reviewed, but all right. Okay, we're getting into the loan part. So after you're in escrow um, and everything is moving along and you have already provided all of your documents to your lender because you did everything in the right order and we're not doing this once we're in escrow, um, your loan is going to go and get reviewed by a processor. The processor is going to just double check everything, put everything into the loan operating system, and then they are going to send it to the underwriter to be reviewed and approved. Now, if you are a complicated buyer, meaning if you're maybe self-employed, all of you guys have already said you're employees, but um, sometimes we do like to have the under underwriter look at your, your documents before you even get into escrow, because if you have anything that is questionable or outside the box, we just don't want to eat up any of those days. If you're in escrow, you might have a 21 day escrow. And so every day that it takes to get some sort of documentation in line, that's taking a day out of your escrow, which can be very short. So we wanna make sure we take care of that stuff up front if we're able to. Now we're going to closing on your home loan, which is just two slides if you wanna cover that. Okay, yeah, yeah sure. So the closing, I think that, um, so in California, the closing is, is a lot less complicated than some other states where you have to um, actually go and have like attorneys involved and things like that. Um, 
when you are closing on your loan, you're going to be signing your loan documents and mobile notary will normally come to you and they will bring you the loan documents. You're going to sign in front of them. Um, certain documents do need to be notarized. And you're also going to be provided with the wire instructions from the escrow officer and the amount that is needed to close. So the remaining balance of whatever is outstanding in addition to that 3% earnest money deposit. Now this is where you come in and you're going to be wiring all of your closing funds. So the remainder of the down payment and then any of the closing costs that have been incurred. And then funding. And funding. All right. So again, California is a little bit different. In some states, you fund and record on the same day. In California, we are going to, uh, actually, I think it's by county. Mm -hmm. it's, by yeah, county. it's by county. LA County, Ventura County. We're going to fund your loan. And then following business day, your loan is going to record with the county. Once it's recording, that's technically your closing date. That's the date that you get your keys to your new house. Yay. And sometimes you can't do special recording if it's rushed at the last minute. And sometimes it's delaying a transaction. All buyer and sellers are fully ready to close. There's time we can fund the morning and close that, that same morning too. But this deadline that the lender will tell you, okay, that wiring instruction, what wiring time is, cut off line is 1 p.m. and the money's not in. But anyways, that's really deep into it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. But anyways. Has any have you guys anybody has already a homeowner or has owned a home in the past? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You guys both. So um when you purchased your home, was the home buying experience what you expected? Yeah. Okay. Some people are really surprised at the yeah. at the many steps that it takes. So I'm just well, you can see, yeah, there's I mean, we're touching the the tip of the iceberg here. You know, it's it's really very deep. Of course, the, the work we do behind the scenes to get you guys you know uh, the key in your hand it's it's, it's a lot of work and uh, that's why you have to definitely have a team behind you that that will take you all the way through each step like that and you don't have to learn that by heart unless you want to win a hat so jocelyn has been so kind to bring us a raffle prize yeah. so we're gonna raffle Ooh. off this nice set that's got it's uh, a wine wine the wine set older. the tumblers um, the maybe some people have questions so um I'm oh yeah yeah let's oh yeah okay well, let's do the raffle let's and then if you have any questions pizza. and we have like, pizzas in the back but if you yes me please favor, eat the pizza you guys uh, please can you pizza. write your name on one of the work one of the sheets and then i'm gonna pick a name and we do have other Prices as well. So, yeah, yeah. We'll just put it inside yeah. the prices. Put it inside the yeah. right Put your name and then put it inside the box. And I'll pick something. And everything on the table, you can grab. We have the, the yeah, bag behind the chair. You can put everything you do. And everything I spoke about, I have actually in writing here. So, oh, like, what are covered, plain. So, okay, I think we're going to drop it in. Oh, yeah. Dropping your name. We don't want to start spinning. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, okay. We're happy in here. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, you want to the time to stay here and do local efforts. So. That's great. That's great. Okay. So I'm not gonna look. There we go. Um, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So, Yeah, they, uh, they provide you with the title insurance on your home. So, brought some goodies. You have to 
book that they left uh, for you on uh, the buyer. So buy a book set. That's a lot of great information in there. So, but uh, questions. Okay. Okay. Who has the questions and the winner will get? The no, I think question. you have to ask the question, Demi, and yeah, they well, get to. No, who has a question uh, to ask? Maybe I, one of you. Okay, let's see. Let's really have time. Yeah. So I'm thinking, what did they learn? What, <laughs> what did we teach them, you guys? That you contingents. I'm just kidding. Okay, all right. You I better have, have that one down. Have to... What are the four main parts of the mortgage payment? The acronym that I said. Yes. Principal, yeah. interest, taxes, and insurance. Yes. Oh. Wow. Wow. You're ready for the Thank you. Good job. Well, key change for Union Home. Insurance question. What would be a, uh, a covered claim? What, one example of a covered claim. Yes. Wow. Yes, there we go. Such an accident. A home yeah. you change for your <laughs> realtor. <laughs> that would be traumatizing. Okay. Um, What's the minimum down payment on an FHA loan? Ooh, three, 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 oh, who said that? You? 3.5. Yeah, she said Oh, three, Tracy. Three, Tracy. Three, um, three. She has more goodies. <laughs> okay, we'll do one more back. A bag or a key chain? Oh. Well, I, have a, I have a I have a question. Okay. Um, <laughs> private mortgages and insurance is required if you put less than what percentage as a down payment? Oh, you said it first. Okay. Wow, less than twenty. <laughs> I guess they did pay attention. You guys, please have some pizza. Seriously, we want you to get there's cheese, there's pepperoni. Yeah, um, we can wrap it up. Ask question, if anybody. Oh, which team would you hire if you were going to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you guys, so much for coming. And you guys are, you take all the stuff with you. Yeah, we have questions. And we have our contact cards on here. You guys can save my my uh my personal cell phone numbers on my card. You can always <laughs> you have a question. Oh, what's question? Two questions. Yeah. So for the two years of employment yeah. history, right? <laughs> It was um, meant for you. I guess the first question is if somebody was living in a, in a different state, mm -hmm. making less money than they make now in this state, yeah, then how would that factor into buying a house? Yeah. In this yeah. state? So, your employment history, it, it's, it, it follows you wherever you go. Yeah. So, um, usually, if, you, if you're talking about a person that is a salaried employee, it doesn't matter how much they made two years ago, their salary is what we're gonna qualify them off of. Um, the current salary. So if you made $50,000 last year and you just got a different job and now you're making $100,000, you're gonna be qualified off that $100,000 divided by 12. Thank That's you guys month. for attending the Zoom. Um, but if you, uh, if, like if you worked at a different, at a different state, as long as you have a two-year consistent employment history, then you're 